Okay, hello and welcome to today's video where I'm going to be talking about what it actually means to discover yourself. So it is my hope that with this conversation I will be able to take some of the pressure off, I think, that can exist in the self-help, personal growth, spirituality world around these selves we're supposed to be discovering and what it's supposed to look like when you truly discover yourself and all of the things that are supposed to happen in your life when you're truly living your purpose and all of this stuff. And I also hope to create maybe a different perspective or a different framework around discovering ourselves and and the process of self-discovery that again make it more fun that make it less like we have to do this thing and make it more realistic to what life is actually like okay so in the spirituality personal growth self-help all of these um worlds that we kind of live in with social media now and in our influencer culture where we see a lot of people showing their lives and saying like right like when I stepped into my truth and when I stepped into who I really am and I discovered my purpose and I discovered who and I said yes to all these things my life became amazing and this thing that I'm really passionate about became my career and I found all my people and I just, right, I stepped out of my boxes and I figured out how life is supposed to go and this magical life that I'm now living on social media is a result of me finding myself and, and being true to my authentic nature and all of this. And I think that that portrayal of what it looks like to discover yourself, again, sets a lot of us up to feel like our lives aren't correct and to make us feel like we're not living our purpose and we're not being our true selves because our lives don't look like that, right? That we didn't discover ourselves and therefore discover a, a passion that can become a viable career that also leads us into community, that leads us into these lifestyles that feel amazing and, and abundant and happy all the time. And I also think that the idea that we're going to discover ourselves and then that's like a thing where it's like there's a before you don't know yourself and then there's an after where you know yourself and that there's like this clear defining line of self-discovery that happens i also think that that is fictitious and built on fantasy and not how we actually work as human beings so from my perspective from what I have seen with working with people for the last 15 years and being on this journey of self-discovery myself, the way that I like to describe the self, and, and this is just my opinion, maybe this doesn't resonate with you or it doesn't resonate with your spiritual practice or what you believe and that's fine, but like I say, this is sort of just what I've observed in my years of being alive and observing people, is that we tend to have a core nature. I, I, I think what I have observed the most is that people have a core personality or a core nature or a core way that they are, they are going to view the world, a core way that they are going to interact with the world, a core set of personality characteristics that shape their likes and dislikes and the things that they like doing and the things they don't like doing. And I think that we all have core kind of aptitudes just areas where we're naturally more inclined to be uh, capable or interested and areas where we're just less inclined to be capable or interested. And within that, we have a lot of variation in how we're nurtured and in the environments that we're raised in and to, and to the things that we're exposed to and the access we have and the education we go through and all that stuff. And these things can enhance our natural personalities and our natural characteristics, or these things can squash them and make us feel like these things are not okay, and, and then we don't get to develop these parts of ourselves. But I don't think that we can say that we're blank slates 
and that just however we are and whatever we're going to do is completely nurture. You see what I'm saying? I, I believe that there is not a white or black nature to reality. It's that who we are and ourselves are a result of both nature and nurture. So we have a natural nature that is heavily affected by our nurture. And so what we need to understand just foundationally kind of about the self is a huge part of what I talk about in self-love and what I try and present as the tools for self-love and the tools for self-discovery is to understand that we are not going to change our fundamental nature. And so much of the time, I think in the spirituality, self-help, personal growth world, we are looking at parts of ourselves that are simply innate to who we are and we are wanting to change those things. So we are either trying to get rid of aspects of self or we are trying to add aspects of self that don't actually exist inherently within us. And then on top of that, the kind of complicating factor is that with nurture, our essential personality traits, our essential nature, our essential who we kind of are as human beings can be shadowed, can be harmed, can be hurt, can be misunderstood, can have an experience where it's not given what it needs to grow naturally into something positive that would be helpful for us in our lives. And so these personality characteristics that are true aspects of our personality, our true aspects of our nature, can, can turn into what look like bad parts of self because of what we've been through. So it is my belief that there is no good or bad part. There is no helpful or harmful part inherently. We just have natural predisposition. And what happens with that natural predisposition can turn our personality and our natural traits into things that cause harm or things that cause um, creativity or pleasure or any of these things. So for instance, like the idea that someone might have an obsessive nature. So there's just, we know that the personality type that we're looking at, the person that we're looking at, has always been the type of person that just gets fixated on things or they have uh, the, a propensity to just zoom, focus, narrow in, and this is just the way that they've kind of always been. That can express itself in a healthy way where we get really interested in a certain topic or a certain subject and we, we really use those powers of focus and those powers of, um, yeah, just like hyper awareness and, and the capacity to be really detailed and really orient, like detail oriented about something as a way of becoming masterful in something. We use that as a, as a tool to help us become strong and, and really aware and really educated or really uh, capable in some area of our lives. That can be like a positive encapsulation of what it looks like to have like one of these stronger obsessive personalities versus it can also go in the direction of when we're not safe or when we don't feel like we have a good outlet for our, our obsessive, uh, our hyper focus, our hyper awareness when we are, grow up in situations where we just don't have access to things, where we have to adapt our way of being to try to keep ourselves safe, those parts of our personality can turn harmful. They can, they can become like addictive. They can become hyper-obsessive about things that don't actually serve to help us you know, make our lives better. And, and that kind of thing can happen. So it's not that hyper, the propensity towards hyperfixation on something is good or bad. It's how is it expressed and how do we use it and, and how is it nurtured? And, and how do we use it in our adaptive, we're all trying to adapt to this world that we're living in um, process. 
here on this planet. You see what I'm saying? So again, I believe that we all have a nature. We all have a way that we are that is that is just like we are all born with an eye color, we're all born with a hair color, we're all born with um, these kind of parts of ourselves that are not going to change. We are not going to fix them, we're not going to alter them biologically in any way. I think that we can apply the same kind of metaphor, the same understanding for parts of our personality that are just innate to who we are. and. That is a really important thing that I think a lot of us are missing on the spirituality, self-help, personal growth path, is that when we get on this personal growth path, it is really easy to look at parts of our, our being, to look at our behaviors, to look at our, our natural inclinations, and to say, this is a bad part of me, and I need to not be this way, because it doesn't fit into society, or because it, it causes me to cause harm to myself or others. And, it's, and we get into this, this place of trying to fix these parts of ourselves as though they are bad and wrong and broken, or we try and get rid of these parts of ourselves because they are bad and they are causing pain or whatever, without understanding that it is just the way that it is expressing right now that it is causing harm. It is just the way that it, this part of our personality adapted to what we were perceiving was the reality we were living in and how we needed to change and how we needed to mold ourselves to be safe and to get our needs met. It's always going to come down to, in my opinion, whenever we have a toxic or harmful way of being, that is always a result of us doing our best to keep ourselves alive and to keep ourselves safe and to fit into the culture we were raised in, that's us doing our best. That's what these toxic behaviors are. And it's us doing the best we had with the resources and the education and the awareness and the access that we had. There are no bad parts of self. There are no bad personality characteristics. There are no bad parts of ourselves. It's how are these parts, how are these parts nourished? How are these parts suppressed? How are these parts given what they needed or not given what they needed? And how have they adapted to keeping us safe in a world where we weren't safe necessarily? That is always my fundamental understanding of who we are and what we are, is that we don't have bad parts. We have parts that are innate to us that were, have either adapted to be helpful parts or adapted to be helpful parts and how they thought they, like how we needed ourselves to be in order to survive in the only ways we knew how that have destructive elements to it. And with that, those parts don't need to be fixed. Those parts don't need to be gotten rid of. Those parts don't need to be seen as good or bad. Rather, it's it's a process of learning what these parts of ourselves are doing for us, how they are adapting and what they are adapting to to try to keep us safe, what we need to do for ourselves to try to change our circumstances so that we can be actually safe, and how we can support these, selves, these parts of selves in growing and maturing. Because again, sometimes parts of ourselves, like, like the propensity to kind of blow up with your anger, for instance. That is not that you are an angry person and there is something wrong with your anger and you need to get rid of or fix this angry part. It's more this angry part has things that it needs to say, this angry part has things that it needs to express, and this angry part may have been the only part of our emotional experience we were allowed to express. So the answer is not to try to get rid of the angry part or make yourself less angry. It's more to say, okay, well, what are we actually angry about? And what are the other emotions that you might be experiencing that you don't know how to express? What part, like how did this part not get nourished and nurtured to mature into a part that could communicate 
clearer, that could understand what was bothering us and to find better ways of managing that bother or those things that were deeply harmful or whatever it was. We need to look at that angry part as an expression that's immature, that needs support to grow to become less harmful while still meeting the need that that part has. Do you see what I'm saying? These, all of the parts of ourselves have needs that they are either getting met or not getting met. And all parts of ourselves are trying to keep us safe and are trying to keep us alive within the culture and the conditioning we were given. So anytime we have a part of self that we have labeled as wrong or bad or that we need to get rid of, this is why I always talk about the path of self-love is foundation, cure, um, compassion, and curiosity. So first things first is we learn to look at these parts of self that we have been conditioned our entire lives to see as wrong and bad and harmful and, and negative and things we need to fix or get rid of as parts of self that are genuinely trying to help us. Parts of self that are doing the best they can to keep us safe the only way they know how. And then, so that's what compassion is. That first step of compassion is really just turning around and looking at yourself and saying, I am doing the best that I can. As much as this behavior might not make any sense to me, as much as I am causing harm to myself or others, whatever it is that, as much as this part of myself gets me rejected or abandoned or abused by other people, and literally we may have been directly told that this part is bad and you have to get rid of it and this is the reason people don't like you and this is the reason whatever whatever it is we have to look at that part and say no this is a part of me that is doing the best that it can to get my needs met to keep me safe to keep me going in this world where i am literally doing the best that i can that is what we first have to say about every part of ourselves we have to start with that compassion because in my opinion, shame and guilt are always lies. Shame and guilt are always lies. This idea that there can be a bad part of ourselves that we need to fix or get rid of, that is always a lie. Any part of self that is causing harm to ourselves or others is in need of understanding. Okay, so we make that base rule of I am just going to start to show up for all parts of myself as though they are good. Even before I understand what they need, even before I understand why they're acting the way that they're acting, even before I go through the emotional catharsis of how these parts have gotten me hurt and shamed and abandoned and abused in the past, we have to start with that I am feeling upset and I am upset about the outcomes of this behavior, I'm upset about how this gets me rejected and all that stuff, we validate that. But we start with, this part is not bad. And then we enter into that curiosity of looking for, okay, how is this part trying to help me? How is this part trying to keep me safe? Where did this part get programmed and conditioned that this is the way that it has to be? Where did I learn that this part of myself is an unacceptable part? And then that journey it looks a little bit different for every part. It looks a little bit different for every person with what we're going to discover, right? It, is this a part of myself that just needs mat maturation? Is this a part of myself that just really got hurt? Is this a part of myself that is trying to express that the way that I've been taught and the ways that I've been raised is wrong and it's not actually me that's out of alignment? But the, those core principles of understanding that there is no bad part of self. And we start with that assumption. And then we start to look for what do we need, what's really going on, what's really, what am I feeling, and going on that journey. That is a huge part of self-discovery. So in my opinion, one of the biggest parts of self-discovery that most self-help, self-love, self-improvement people are missing is the starting with the assumption that all parts of ourselves are good and then looking to feel and figure out how we can support all parts of ourselves in growing and learning and becoming more creative and more harmonious in the ways that they hadn't been able to before. Right? Starting with the assumption that all parts are good and then looking for how they're good and how we can grow and mature them. That's that first aspect. So rather than trying to get rid of parts, 
rather than trying to fix parts, rather than trying to do whatever we're trying to do to make the parts of ourselves that currently exist different, we first start with assuming these parts are good and looking for what these parts need in order to be supported. The second part is, so, so again, what we're all missing on the self-love or on the personal growth path is that there is no bad part. And that part of self-discovery is getting connected to these parts of self that we've been working so hard to change and fix and get rid of, connecting to these parts and starting to understand them the way that they have not been understood before. That is step number one in true self-discovery is what do these parts of myself that all are here and that currently exist, what do they need? What do they need to be supported and loved and, and matured in the ways that they hadn't been supported and loved and matured in the past? What are they doing for me and how are they trying to help me? And how can I better understand these parts? And again, that's not always an easy answer and it's not always a quick answer, but that's, that's the real path of self-discovery. Okay, so the second part is understanding that all of us are going to have parts of self that do not fit into culture. All of us are going to have parts of self that do not fit into culture, that do not fit into the expectations that our caregivers had for us, that do not fit into the expectation that the, the world we live in expects of us. <laughs> that do not fit into the expectation of what we're expecting ourselves to become and what we wish we could be and what we wish we could do. All of us are going to have parts of self that are rebelling from culture, that don't fit into culture, that hurt because culture doesn't work, that, that essentially, like I say, can't make the, the way that everyone else is living feel good. And this is another part that can feel really challenging on the personal growth and the self-discovery path, is to acknowledge and come to terms with the fact that we have parts of self that are never going to fit in. The, to acknowledge and to come to terms with that we have parts of self, that we have needs, that we have desires, that we have ways of being that work for us, that are outside of what everyone else is doing, what is expected of us, what we had hoped we would become one day if we just did enough self-help and personal growth and, and expansive work, coming to terms with who we actually are and how that doesn't work with society. So again, when we're continually in a situation where we keep trying to date the way that culture tells us to date or we keep trying to go down a certain career path or we keep trying to uh, express ourselves in some way that continually leads us into situations where we're self-harming, where we're self-abusing, where we need to numb, where we need to cope, where we're constantly struggling, like we just can't get ourselves to be successful at the thing, we're constantly sabotaging ourselves. Sometimes we have to take a step back and say, okay, is this not some flaw in myself that I need to fix and get better and do better at? Could it possibly be that this is my true personality saying the way that everyone else is doing things does not work for me? And again, this can be really, really, really challenging to accept because we live in a culture <laughs> where we have all been raised to blame and shame and abandon and reject ourselves for the things that get us rejected and for the things that don't fit into culture. We have all been trained to believe that if I am the way that I am, if I can't make this thing work, if I can't make these relationships work, if I can't make this uh, way of making money in the world work, if I can't make myself become this thing that I'm supposed to become, then I'm doomed that I'm going to be alone forever, I'm going to be homeless on the street, I'm never going to be able to make money, I'm never going to be able to find a way of life that actually works for me. Because we have all, again, been culturally conditioned that, that there is a very narrow parameter of what success and a good life looks like. 
and we got this from our families, we got this from our religions, we got this from education, we got this from general culture. But the, ult the, the ultimate truth is that we have all kind of built a, a framework for what a good enough life is supposed to be and is supposed to look like. And for most of us, we can't see how deeply specific that is. Like we kind of think, I have like a general idea of what I want. But when if we really started to like ask you like, what would it take for you to feel like you're living the right life? What would it take for you to feel like you're doing what you should be doing? We might have like a vague sense of like what the career looks like or what the, the relationship status looks like or whatever. But we will have a pretty specific idea of like, I need to be working like this kind of job and these many hours and I need to be making this kind of money and and I have to have this kind of family structure and and my health is supposed to look like this and like we have a pretty specific idea of what success and what right and what good is and we have a very strong feeling of failure and not feeling good enough and feeling like we're off track and we're not doing it right when we're not living up to those standards. And for a lot of us, we can live, literally watch as other people out there live completely alternative to our kind of conditioning lifestyles that do relationships totally different than us, that do career totally different than us, that don't value the things that we value. And we might be able to get to a place of saying, it's okay that they do that. It's fine for them, that's great for them. But subconsciously, we, we are like, but I could never do that. I could never live that way. Even if it's working for them. Even if we're seeing that they're having success and they're happy and, they're, and it's totally working, we might be like, well, that's good for them, but that would never work for me. And most time, we can't even go that far. Most of the time, we've been so indoctrinated and conditioned that anything outside of what we've been trained and taught to believe as being the right way to be, We've been conditioned and coaxed and coached <laughs> into seeing anything else as bad, as dangerous, as failure, as embarrassing, as fill in the blank negative. And this is another big thing that keeps a lot of us trapped in trying to fix ourselves versus looking for a way of life that actually works for who we actually are is that we have these fundamental assumptions about what we are supposed to be and what success looks like and what a good life is. And we are saying in every area that I'm not living up to that very specific expectation, I am failing, I am broken, there's something wrong with me and every part of myself that doesn't allow me to do that is a bad, wrong, shameful part. Every part of myself that can't work the nine to five is bad and wrong and shameful. Every part of me that can't just date the normal heterosexual two, two and a half kids white picket fence can't make that life work, that's bad and wrong. And again, it's not even necessarily that we're thinking it's bad and wrong. It can literally be like, but if I don't do that, I'll die. If I don't do that, I'm, I'm never going to have any of the things that I want in life. And so again, we have to start to understand that the conditioning that we've been given about what a good life is and what a success is and what we're supposed to do is really tied into our sense of safety. It's tied into our sense of if I can just do these things and follow these rules, it will give me the peace and the security and the protection and the love and the acceptance that I desire. That's what we're really looking for. When we're trying to fit ourselves into these boxes, when we're trying to become what culture has told us we need to become, what we are really doing is we are trying to make ourselves safe. We are trying to get rid of our pain and we are trying to um, guarantee that we will have pleasure. That's what we're doing. Because again, that first program that we got in the very beginning of our lives is that acceptance equals provision. So we really are trying to do what we were culturally, 
what we were deeply indoctrinated to believe was the right thing. Because again, to us, doing the right thing means we're going to be approved of, means we're going to be safe. And also, that's our rule book for how we're going to make ourselves happy. So you see what I'm saying here? Sometimes when we start to say, well, maybe there are parts of myself that mean that I will never be able to do that. The automatic fear that comes in is then I'm never going to be okay. I'm never going to be able to make it. My whole life is going to fall apart because if I can't do that, there is no way that I will be safe. There's no way that I will be good. I don't know how else to think of a life that I could live where I could still get my needs met and still be loved and still be safe and still be happy without this framework because that's the framework we have for what reality is. That's the framework we have that anytime we feel lost and scared and alone and bad, we have the, okay, well, in what areas am I not living up to this expectation? Those are the, that's what's wrong. That's why I feel so bad. That's why I feel lost. That's why I feel pain. It's because of all of these parts of myself that aren't living up to the rule book. And we have this desire to hold on to the idea that we have the right rule book. We have the right blueprint. We have been given the right idea about what to value and what we should become and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And it's just our failure to live up to it that's causing us our pain. And we want to believe that and we want to hold on to that because the alternative is, okay, maybe there isn't something wrong with me. Maybe my pain is not being caused because I'm failing to live up to a thing. But then, what's going to make me happy? If, if my blueprint and my rule book for what I'm supposed to become in order to become happy is false, what's going to make me happy? How do I figure out what a good life is? How do I figure out what will be safe and will be successful if I don't have my rule book? So learning to understand that when we really start to embrace these parts of ourselves, that just don't fit into culture, like I am never going to make myself the kind of person who's able to do this or that, the first thing that's going to happen is that existential crisis fear that we're never going to be able to live a good life. That if we can't do that, we're guaranteed to be in pain and lost and suffering forever. That's going to be the first thought. That any other way of life might work for other people, but it will never work for us. And we're going to lose everyone we love and everything is going to come crumbling down on top of us and trying to figure something else out just is too hard and too scary and we don't know how to do it. That's going to be the first thing that comes up. So learning to love these parts of ourselves and to, and to see ourselves through that existential fear and to see ourselves through that very like deep kind of uh, nervous system program that's trying to keep us on track so that we will be loved and approved of and therefore safe and then also to keep us on track with our perception of reality. It's going to lead then to existential crisis where we question, what is good? <laughs> what is success? What would I actually want if this isn't the thing that I want to do? What if I lose everyone? Then what? How would I, how would I make that okay? And Taking the leap to actually start to accept these parts of ourselves that don't fit in is a huge leap on the self-love path. And I want to make that clear because I think a lot of the time, myself included, spiritual teachers and, and personal growth teachers and all that stuff can make it sound so easy. Like it should be so easy to just embrace yourself to just embrace who you really are and, and embrace your uniqueness and embrace that way of being that's just so natural to you. And then you'll find this awesome life. And it's like, that might be true for people whose natural selves fit into culture a little bit better. That is going to be true for people whose natural selves, whose natural way of being and what works for them kind of already fits into a model of reality that has been given to them. When, when you kind of fit into your family model or you fit into the culture that you were born and raised into and, and your personality and your way of being goes with that, it is going to be easier 
to embrace yourself and to embrace these parts of yourself when the majority of you or a lot of you sort of fits with what you're already doing and what you were trained to be as good and successful and these two things line up. The more your conditioning doesn't match your true nature, the harder this is going to be. So for me, for instance, there was essentially like no parts of me <laughs> that fit into the model I was given. There was just so little about me that could make the this is what life is model that I was handed work. I suffered in pretty much every way possible because the life that works for me is so different from the life that I was given that being on this journey for the last long time, since I was 14, this slow build of just, okay, I'm going to accept this part, okay, I'm going to accept this part, this slow journey of, of really earnestly trying to fit in and honestly trying to make the work thing work, making normal relationships work, making Christianity work, making how normal people socialize work, like earnestly giving it my best chance, my best effort, and, and just seeing over and over and over again that I just suffered and I suffered and I suffered and I suffered and I sabotaged and I couldn't make it work and I couldn't be happy and I couldn't, I could never live up to expectation, I could never become anything. I could have let that mean that I was just a failure and that I just sucked because that's what culture was telling me. That's what other people were telling me. That, that was the narrative I grew up with, was if you don't fit this, if you don't do this, you are broken. There is something wrong with you and you need to change. You need to change so that you fit in. That was the one message that I got my entire life. My, my parents' mantra was, don't embarrass me. <laughs> and like I say, I could have done that and I think I just would have killed, like not, I, I, I would have, I would have been in a lot of pain and I, and I don't know that I would have figured a lot of stuff out. I would have lived a very hard life of suffering. But again, I'm speaking from personal experience that I know what it's like to look at yourself in the mirror and to look at your inner self and say, like, I'm, I'm never going to make this work. I'm, I'm going to have to take the risk to figure something else out because my two options are, like, literally die in this because I can't do it or die trying to figure something else out. And I kind of, there have been points in time in my life where I've been like, I would rather take the risk to see if I can find something else out because I know at this point that continuing to try to make this work isn't going to work. So like I say, getting to the point where we are so exhausted with trying to fit ourselves into a box we're never going to fit in, getting to a point where we are so exhausted trying to become these people we're never going to become, where we are so tired of blaming ourselves and shaming ourselves and making it our fault that we can't do it, that we're willing to take the existential risk of seeing what might actually be natural to us and what might actually work for us and then seeing if we can slowly start to build a life around that. Sometimes we have to get that fed up before we're willing to do it. Because like I say, I believe and in my experience, the nervous system is going to be screaming at us so loud that we're going to die if we do that that for a lot of us, the, the fear, we just get locked in that fear, right? And then again, just it's so important to remember that none of us are given conditioning as like this is a way that we could be, right? All of us, the way that we've been indoctrinated and raised in this culture is anything outside of the culture we were raised in 
we're going to be continually fed messages about how bad that is and how dangerous that is and and how we will be rejected and and all of this stuff if we were ever to do like what those people are doing do you see what i'm saying and that is partially because the people that are doing the conditioning <laughs> our caregivers our governments our education systems whoever it is that is running the systems that we're under benefit from the systems as they are and want people to be in those systems and they are doing the demonizing of anything different as a way of trying to make themselves feel safe when people demonize other ways of being that are objectively non-harmful like other ways of having romantic relationships that are different from how you have romantic relationships other ways of viewing spirituality than the ways that you view spirituality even differing political views or family structures or ways of working and earning money when we have people that objectively that demonize and make these other ways of being wrong and bad and sinful and harmful when they are objectively not wrong and bad and sinful and harmful like when we can really look at them and just say okay these people loving each other in this way causes no more harm than these people loving each other in this way when we can say like there there's no actual objective harm being caused in this other way of being and yet you are making it sound like anyone who does that is ruining society or ruining their own lives that's when we can start to say okay that's just your coping mechanism for assuring yourself that you're doing it right to make yourself feel safe in this world that is very chaotic cuz that's the other thing is this world that we live in is so incredibly complex there are so many vulner vulnerabilities and things that can go wrong and things that can hurt us and and ways that we feel out of control and like we're not safe and like we don't know what we're doing that again we are we are desperately looking for a rule book for what is the right and best and most true way of being and we are looking for that because we are hoping that if we align with that we will be safe we will have provision we will be the chosen people who have everlasting life or whatever it is we're looking for that because we're afraid of all of the vulnerabilities of being alive and then when we are shown that there are other ways of being that contradict our own that are different from our own our automatic reaction is going to be to reject that and to figure out how it's wrong and to figure out how it's bad because if we were to accept that way of being into our understanding of reality that means now i have to expand my understanding of reality it makes it more complex it makes it more as in i am becoming aware of the complexity that i wasn't aware of before and that makes me feel less safe and that makes me feel less sure that i'm doing the right thing cuz again i don't think anyone has the perfect way of life we are all struggling and suffering and having pain in some way because of the choices that we're making and the things that we're doing cuz we don't have a complete view of how reality works and so sometimes when we see other ways of being that maybe would actually genuinely work better for us but in order to be able to live in that new different way we would have to change our fundamental assumptions about how reality works about what is good and bad right and wrong what is moral and immoral and therefore we lose our foundation for how we make decisions and how we judge ourselves and how we judge others and how we keep ourselves safe that's going to be too scary we'd rather just stay in our box and make it that they're wrong and i'm right so a lot of the time when we're starting to embrace our our true self the degree to which our true self is different from our culture is going to be the degree that we are afraid of these parts of ourselves and that we are going to see them as evil and wrong and bad and as going to be our demise 
because these are the parts of ourselves that are going to make us live in ways that we have been trained our entire lives are wrong and bad and will kill us. So that's a huge part of this. That understanding that when we start to embrace our true selves, we are going to be, we are going to be coming up against our conditioning, which is our rule book for life, which is, for better or for worse, how we're finding our way in the world. It's an existential crisis to discover ourselves a lot of the time when the parts of ourselves that exist don't fit into culture. So this is why I believe that self-love is how we exit the matrix. Is when we stop blaming and shaming and looking to fix the broken parts of ourselves that do not exist, we can finally start to say, okay, well, why does this way of being hurt? Why can't I get myself to do it? Why doesn't this work for me? What was my conditioning? How was I brought up? And that's how we start to jailbreak ourselves from the perception that we were given. Because remember, we were all given a perception. We were not given truth. We were given this is how we view the world. This is how we make decisions. This is what we value. And that's how we're going to set up our framework for how to make choices. And sometimes those values and that framework and that aligns with real reality in the sense that when we make choices based on that framework, we create more creativity, more harmony, and, it, and in the, the results that we get are actually good. Sometimes that framework is actually like what we have been taught is good. What we have been taught is right. What we have been taught is productive and success. In real reality, causes harm. But our minds are so conditioned to believe that this is the right thing, that if it hurts us, or if we see that it's causing pain, we think there must be something wrong with us or that, because conditioning is right. That's how we start to jailbreak ourselves, when we start to say, no, if something hurts, Perhaps my conditioning is wrong. Perhaps the rule book that I was given is wrong. That's why feeling is the big key to getting out of the matrix. Because our minds can be conditioned and programmed to believe anything. To, to look for how anything is true and right and, and it can justify anything. But we can't erase consequence. We can't erase the feeling and the actual outcome of our actions. So that's how we start to notice, okay, I've been told that success is working a nine to five and making this amount of money at this kind of job. But it hurts me to try to do that. So maybe what I'm seeing is that that kind of, that amount of work, that a, what I have to sacrifice of myself and my life in order to work that hard, the, that actual work itself causes harm. So it's not good. It's not actually the best way. It causes harm to me and it causes harm to others. Right? So much of our culture right now is built on exploitation and built on this idea of productivity at all costs, built on the idea of humans literally being as valuable as what they contribute to the system, that consumption rules the day, and the more you can consume, the more consumer power you have, the better you are as a human being. Like, that's our conditioning. So then the, the ones of us who are like, that does not work for me, that does not feel good, that does not, even if I am successful at it, it hurts. We're the ones saying, I think culture is wrong. I think our definition of success is wrong. I think our, our basic value system is out of alignment because it's causing pain. It might make a lot of sense. We have all the reasons in the world for why it's good and why we should do it and, what, and all this. But ultimately, when we look at outcome and we look at how it makes us feel, 
It's not good. You see? So in embracing the parts of ourselves that don't fit into culture, in embracing the parts of ourselves that don't fit into the, the ways that we have been told we need to be in order to be happy and successful, it doesn't necessarily always mean that culture is wrong on its face or that other people who are doing what you can't do are wrong and bad. Sometimes it's just different strokes for different folks. Okay? Sometimes the things you're going to discover do and do not work for you is just an individual thing. And the things that, you, like me and my sister, right? Like there are things that we were culturally raised with that totally work for her that do not work for me. And there are things that really work for me that do not work for her. And that is not because there's a right or a wrong way to be. It's that there's a right way for me to be and there's a right way for her to be and there are lots of elements involved with her right way and my right way. And some of her conditioning overlaps with who she actually is. Some of what works for me does not overlap with who she actually is. And there's no wrong. Neither of us are wrong or right. And sometimes our true nature is showing us where culture is out of alignment. But it is in, in embracing these parts of ourselves and making room for them and looking for what do these parts of me need, what would make me happy, even if we can't imagine actually being able to live that way or being able to survive that way in the beginning, but allowing ourselves to imagine like, okay, what if I were to just let go of all of these things that don't work? Just for a little bit, just to consider what it might be like to not have to do this. And we open the door for that curiosity of could there be other ways that I'm just not even seeing, because that's the other thing, right? With our perception, there's always going to be other options and ways of life that could absolutely work for us that we haven't seen. We're always going to feel like there's no other option, there's no other way. I've seen every other way and that wouldn't work for me and it's, if this isn't going to work, then nothing is. When really, it's like, no, we have to accept that our perception has been limited and, and anything that didn't match our conditioning up till this point probably got filtered out. We just didn't even see it. Because again, that would have rocked our worldview too much. Our perception machine is continually filtering out that which it says challenges our status quo, challenges what we know to be true, would make it so that what we know to be true doesn't make perfect sense anymore, and it's filtering it out, filtering it out, filtering it out to the point that our consciousness doesn't even see it. So then when we start to say, well, maybe this way of being isn't gonna work for me, we will have that experience of like, th th but there's no other way. I've seen every other way and it's not going to work. And we kind of have to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt that we haven't seen every other way. That we haven't seen the way of being that might actually work for us. That we don't know where we're going and that that's a good thing. That embracing that unknown and then just getting curious about little steps we can take towards what does and doesn't work for us. Understanding we're not going to figure it out in an insight. So yes, so how do I know if it's my conditioning or if it's truly not right for me? First things first is you validate that you don't like it. We have to start with validating how we're actually feeling in this moment and making it okay that we feel how we feel because most of us don't know how to give ourselves that, right? We, we want to know the answer before we've even given ourselves the emotional catharsis. So in the beginning, when we're looking at something and we're saying, okay, I'm trying this thing over and over and over again and I can't make myself do it. Can we start with compassion and, and that, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. What if this isn't a flaw in me? What if this isn't something wrong or bad with me? What if this is just how I feel right now and I don't have to have the answers right now? I'm just going to make it safe that I feel how I feel and that I think what I think and that I like what I like and that I don't like what I don't like. We have to make it safe. Second thing is we have to grieve all of the times, not necessarily all of them, but we have to give ourselves space to grieve 
all that time that we've spent trying to force ourselves to do this thing. Trying to force ourselves to be this way or not be this way or to fit into this conditioning or whatever. And just all of the pain and all of the stuff that's been left over that we haven't been allowed to look at because we've been trying to make this thing work. We got to let ourselves look at that stuff. And through doing that, through the emotional catharsis of making it okay, of like, I really wish I'd never had to do that. I really wish I'd never had to do that. I really wish I'd been able to do this. And, and, and making that stuff okay and validating that stuff and going on that emotional catharsis journey, then we're gonna start to get clues for, okay, so what would I like instead? Maybe this doesn't work for me. Maybe this is, this is something that I'd be interested in. It starts to open our perspective to other ways of being when we've given ourselves that emotional process then we start to get curious about, okay, so if this is really a part of me that I'm never going to do this, I'm never going to feel good doing this, then what? Do you see what I'm saying? We have to give ourselves that emotional catharsis first. We have to give ourselves the validation. We have to allow ourselves to go through that period of being upset of, at all the stuff that was forced on us, of being upset about what really never felt good and that we blamed ourselves for, and then seeing that that wasn't our fault, that we were allowed to feel that way, giving ourselves permission to grieve that and to be upset and to be mad at our caregivers and mad at society, and then we will start to see. Does this make sense? Let me know if, if that kind of makes sense. A lot of us want to just rush to the answer and we're forgetting that we're emotional beings and that we process emotionally just as much as we process intellectually. That we can't rush ourselves to the answer a lot of the time because the answer is in our emotion. Yeah, and, and the more you give yourself the space to experience the emotionality of it, the more your emotions are then going to be able to guide you for what is actually correct and what isn't. Because again, Feeling and emotion is part of the action. So giving myself compassion and grace and patience is what I need. Absolutely. Right? Because again, this is kind of my, my last point that I want to make. Is that we don't discover ourselves in a moment. And then, like I say, there's this before and after. Rather, we're going to continually be returning to these parts of self that got neglected and abused and have been trying to fit into a box. And giving them space and giving them time and emotionally processing that. And as we emotionally process that, and as we give that space and time and light, there may be some parts that we discover, okay, now that I've processed it, this actually isn't so bad. But this thing I really can't do. And maybe this doesn't work for me. And maybe this does work for me. And then we start to see different things and we start to go on a path. So that's really the bottom line, is that this is always going to be an unfolding path. Who you are and and what you're going, like self-discovery, yes, we're going to discover some just fundamental truths about ourselves that we're just going to have as understandings moving forward. And that's sometimes a challenging thing, right? Like, I am, I'm just not the kind of person who's going to be able to socialize like that. And so for the rest of my life, I kind of just understand, like, I'm an introvert. I kind of need this space. I'm never going to be the kind of person that can go to seven parties in a week. And we start to just understand these basic fundamental things about ourselves and we build a, a life around those structures that we understand about ourselves. And then yes, life feels like, okay, now that I sort of have this foundation for who I am, I can build on that. And we are always going to be discovering new things about ourselves. We are always going to be discovering things that worked for us for now and then don't work for us later and that we're part of the journey and like super great and then we're over it and we... This is the other thing. We are always going to be upgrading our understanding of ourselves. We're all, we are going to change some things that really work for us for a period of time that don't work for us anymore. And true self-discovery is understanding that just wherever you are on this path of your life, the only thing you can really do to be authentic to yourself is to simply embrace what you're feeling, what you're thinking, where you're at right now. And then asking yourself the question, how do I best support the me that actually exists in this moment? When it's not about what's my passion and what's my purpose and all these things, because the more 
We are simply showing up for the version of ourselves that actually exists in this moment. And our framework, like our literal perception filter is, how do I best support the me that actually exists right now? All of that other stuff, you'll figure it out. Because sometimes the answer to that is, I need to write a blog. I need to leave my marriage. I need to whatever. Like sometimes it's going to be these big understandings about yourself. But most of the time, it's just going to be like, I need this kind of emotional processing. And then I had this little revelation while I did that. And that's a little piece of the puzzle. And then I did this thing. And I did this thing. And I did this thing. And all of these things give me these little pieces of the puzzle that as I apply that knowledge, as I continue to just show up for the me that exists right now, in support of the me that exists right now, we slowly start to build this life that all of a sudden we wake up one day and we're like, oh, okay, this kind of works for me. Do you see what I'm saying? How do I show up for the me that actually exists right here, right now? So I'm feeling what I'm feeling. Can I validate that? I like what I like and I don't like what I don't like. Can I validate that? I don't understand why I like something or don't like something. Can I make that okay? Showing up for the you that actually exists. These are the personality characteristics I have right now. How am I trying to get my needs met? How am I trying to keep myself safe? How are all these parts trying to help me? That's what showing up for ourselves is. That's compassion and that's curiosity. So the pendulum sways so hard. I'm afraid to validate the moment, the moment me because believing that is like believing the 180 thought. Yeah. And again, a lot of us think if I validate who I am right now, I'm going to get stuck in this. And that's, that's never reality. The more we validate who we are right here, right now, the more we look to just support who and what we are right now, that's how we grow. Growth happens purely by meeting the needs you actually need, right? A plant does not grow because we yell at it to grow. A plant grows because we gave it water when it needed water. We gave it food when it needed food. We gave it sunlight when it needed sunlight, and then it grew. That's exactly how we work. We grow simply by showing up for the actual version of us that actually exists right here, right now. If you went to a little baby and you said, okay, you're going to be a rocket scientist. Here's your rocket science book. Even if that little baby is meant to become a rocket scientist, is that book going to help that baby? No. What's going to help that baby become a rocket scientist in the moment that it's a baby? Breast milk. You see what I'm saying? It, it seems like it, how is that going to make my baby a rocket scientist? Well, because what the baby needs right now is sustenance to grow its body and to grow its brain. Showing up for any other version of that baby and giving it anything other than what it needs right here, right now, it will not grow. We need to start to treat ourselves exactly the same way. Yes. Showing up for our own innocence. Assuming there is no bad part. Making room for our feelings and learning to validate. It's a process. It's not a thing that changes your life overnight. But it gets us off this pendulum. And you will see. The more you validate the you that actually exists, the more the you that actually exists can guide you towards what actually works for you. The more you are cutting yourself off from the you that actually exists, the more you're cut off from your guidance. The more you're cut off from this works for me, this doesn't work for me. That's how that works. The only version of you that you have any power over is this version. And the more you can show up for who you are right here, right now, the more you're going to discover about yourself, the more you're going to be able to do something about that discovery. And it's okay to not know. That's the other big thing. I don't know why I feel this way. I don't know why this doesn't work for me. I don't know what would work instead. That's okay. When we can say, okay, I'm validating what's coming up, even if I don't have the answer, even if I don't have the fix, even if I can't make it better or different right now. When we relax into that unknown and do the validating, the answers will come. 
They will come on the other side of the validating and the feeling and the making it safe to not know. Uh, thank you. I found you years ago when I was first starting to contemplate this same problem. My marriage leaving it, I found an article and video on Pinterest and walked away thinking, whoa, she put into words and disconnected thoughts I had. That's what I'm hoping to do. <laughs> you are worth it. You are worthy. Who you are right here, right now, is good enough. It's okay to not know why, it's okay to not know how, it's okay to not know how to process. Just make room, journal, make it okay that you are who you are right now and start to focus on how can I support the me that actually exists. That's the path. Okay? So that's all I have to say for now. And I've been forgetting to mention that I have a mystery school. So if this kind of content is something you like and you want like a step-by-step -step course, I've laid that out. Um, it's in my mystery school. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find it in the link below. If you're watching this on Instagram, you can find it in my bio. Um, and it's not a sales pitch. I, I'm just wanting to let you know that I have that thing. Yes, it is. it costs money, but I do hope to put out as much free content as I can, and I hope that it's helpful. So there's those two options. Um, other than that, have a fantastic week. You are exactly who you should be. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with you. Life is about figuring out how to best support the us that actually exists and figuring out systems and ways of being that support us the best that we can within the conditions that exist, which aren't always going to be perfect. We do our best to support ourselves. Okay? One step at a time. One step at a time. Who are you in this moment and how can you best support that? That is the growth path. That is the self-discovery path. Okay? You got it. You got the tools you need. You can do this. Have a great night, have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.